Ladies and gentlemen, as the Chairman of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, it's a pleasure to welcome everyone here today to our defence debate between Minister for Defence Material Colonel Mike Kelly and the Shadow Minister for Defence Senator David Johnson. We're very pleased by the response to the invitations. There's a great deal of interest in defence and national security matters and ASPE intends that this defence debate will be a feature of every ensuing Australian general election campaign. And at the outset, could I thank Hewlett Packard, which has a very close and effective relationship with ASPE for their support and sponsorship today. I'm sure everyone looks forward to both an informed and vigorous exchange. The Commonwealth's responsibility, its primary responsibility, of course, is the defence of Australia and our interests. ASPE takes its role in shaping the defence debate, in contributing the defence debate, in deepening and broadening the debate very seriously. And we recognise, as everyone here today will acknowledge, we do live in a time of changing geostrategic circumstances in both the Pacific and in the Indian oceans. The return of China as a great power, as a global power, the emergence of Indonesia and of India, the United States rebalancing in our region of the world, and not to mention the continuing significance of our traditional friends such as Japan and Korea. The election campaign to date has been marked, remarked, uh, remarkable for the number of times defence issues have, uh, have cropped up. Uh, in a budget sense, in a uh, forced posture sense, in a procurement sense. So our debate today is both uh, timely and, uh, and very well placed. And I look forward to Catherine McGrath moderating in a little while. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, debates are, uh, of course, characterised as art rather than science. People ask me from time to time, what's the best exchange I've ever heard? Well, the best exchange is actually an answer from the 1980 United States presidential debate, and uh, Mike, you and David can both note this one because it was extremely successful. The 1980 US presidential campaign was unusual because there were actually three candidates who were president. The incumbent was President Jimmy Carter. Of course, the challenger was Governor Ronald Reagan of California. But there was an, an independent congressman uh, named uh, John Anderson who was also running for the presidency, and the uh, American uh, media afforded him equal time in the debates. And at one point in one of the debates, <coughs> the congressman was asked a question along these lines. Congressman, simultaneously you are pledged to cut taxes, increase defence spending, increase outlays on Social Security while uh, balancing the federal budget. How do you plan to achieve these mutually contradictory aims? Deadpan Anderson looked straight down the barrel of the camera and said, I do it with mirrors. Now, Mike, David, that answer worked. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I mentioned uh, Hewlett Packard's uh, generous support and sponsorship of today's event. It's now my pleasure to ask the Chief Technology Officer of HP, David Cooper, to come to the podium. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen, and uh, a warm welcome uh, to this great event. And first, I'd uh, like to acknowledge our distinguished guests that we've come to see debate today, the Honourable Dr. Mike Kelly, Minister for the Defence Materiel, the Senator Honourable David Johnston, the Opposition Spokesman for Defence, uh, Ms. Catherine McGrath, the Senior Asia Correspondent for the ABC, who will be facilitating this great debate, and uh, Stephen Woosley and Peter Jennings, our representatives from ASPE who have kindly put on this event today. And of course, our invited guests and media. So I know I'm standing here between yourselves and lunch, but not wine, so that's a good thing. But I'll, I'll try and keep this short, but put a little message there. So firstly, uh, uh, I'm very pleased to see the turnout here. It's fantastic that uh, this event, arranged at short notice, has received the attention that it deserves, because I think it's been fair to say that defence and security probably hasn't had the prominent position that it should have in the federal election campaign for this year. 
at a local level, there's no question in my mind that the Australian Department of Defence does a fantastic job for our country. It protects our land, our people, and our way of life. And I saw that firsthand uh, when I was younger, and I, I uh, worked on the HMAS Aronta as they did a workup and mission readiness. And I saw just how hard they were pushed uh, in preparation for deploying into Iraq. And I have a real appreciation uh, for the work that they do on behalf of the Australian people. But I think these are disruptive times and there are lots of questions being asked of the department. Questions like, who are we really defending ourselves from? What sort of defence force do we need in terms of structure, in terms of cost and culture? And can we afford a dedicated defence industry anymore? And that last question is actually quite pertinent for myself. I've worked for two small Australian companies in the defence industry. One of them still operates today and the other does not. And if you look at it, the figures for the Department of Defence are astounding. They employ over 100,000 people and I think I'll have to read this according to ASPE's latest budget brief. They cost $69,681,980.82 per day to run. This is clearly a very large and very complex and very expensive organisation. And let's not forget the thousands of businesses that support the Department of Defence and require the Department of Defence to support their business. But one thing is for certain, with changing threat profiles and a budget under significant scrutiny to find savings, Defence will need to adapt and be innovative. And so will the industry that supports it, like HP. And actually, I think at HP, we're in a position to understand the scale and complexity that the department deals with. We have a workforce of over 320,000 people deployed across 170 countries. More than a billion people rely on HP technology every day. And we support that with one of the world's largest supply chains. And like Defence, we've recognised that our business environment is also changing rapidly. At HP, we build a plan to adapt. We're cutting costs. We're streamlining operations and we're investing in innovation. We spend over $3.4 billion per annum in research and development on disruptive technology around things like cloud, big data, mobility and security. And we call this the new style of information technology. But today we're here to understand what the new style of defence is. What force structure do we need? Where will it operate and potentially not at Garden Island? How much will it cost? How can efficiencies be found? And how do we continue to innovate and adapt to new threats in this environment? And the answers to these questions will depend on, upon the outcome of the election and specifically upon the policies of our distinguished guests here to debate today. So HP is very pleased to be the sponsor of today's debate about one of the country's most important issues, defence and security, where our key speakers will discuss defence spending and savings, challenges, procurement plans, current operations and defence industry issues. So I'm sure we're all looking forward to learning more about the new style of defence. And once again, thank you for joining us at the HB Aspie Great Defence Debate for 2013. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2013 Aspie Great Debate. I'm Catherine McGrath. I'd like to introduce the Honourable Mike Kelly and Senator the Honourable David Johnson. We're meeting at a time, as always, when the defence sector is crucial in Australian society and the news agenda. Military action against Syria is being discussed. The Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, held a press conference this morning where he said that he believes the Syrian regime is responsible for the chemical attack and that the next step for the international community is a robust response. In this week, the announcement was made that under a Labor government, Navy headquarters would move from Sydney to Queensland and other parts to the north and northwest, and there is a big naval shipbuilding announcement from the government later today. Our two speakers are the key people in this area in the government and opposition. Dr Mike Kelly was born in Adelaide in 1960. He trained as a lawyer and army officer. Uh, he was an army officer from 1987 to 2007. In the Army, Mike Kelly served with distinction and reached the rank of Colonel. He was deployed at various locations, including Somalia and East Timor. 
Dr Kelly entered Parliament as a Labor MP for the marginal seat of Eden Monero in 2007 and was appointed Parliamentary Secretary for Defence. Since then, he's held various portfolios, including agriculture and water, and is now the Def Minister for Defence Materiel. With his military experience, he's brought a unique approach to this portfolio. Senator the Honourable David Johnston is the Shadow Minister for Defence and Liberal Party Senator for Western Australia. David Johnston joined the Liberal Party as a student in Western Australia and went on to become State Director of the party. He practised law in Kalgoorlie and Perth with, and has uh, great experience, particularly early in the early years in the mining sector. Senator Johnston entered Parliament with a Senate position he won in 2001, taking up the position in 2002 and was Minister for Justice and Customs in 2007. During much of his time in Parliament, he's concentrated on the defence portfolio, visiting every Australian defence base and operations in Afghanistan and Iraq. Gentlemen, you are both highly respected in the defence sector and we welcome you to this ASPE great debate. Now, the rules. Thank you. Each speaker will have eight minutes for an opening address. There will be a bell at seven minutes on the eighth, eighth minute bell. It's time to finish the sentence and uh, end the address. Then there will be questions from ASPE staff, which, which will include questions that members of the public have sent into ASPE, so highly specific to the defence area. With each of those questions, the speakers will have four minutes to answer. We had a toss earlier on, which Senator David Johnston won. He will be the sp first speaker for eight minutes. Please welcome Senator David Johnston. Thank you, Catherine. Well, thank you, Catherine, and thank you all for attending. Uh, Defence hasn't played much of a, a role until suddenly this week, um, which I think is more the pity. You'll be pleased to know that my original announcement to move Fleet Base East Holus Bolus to Rocknest in Western Australia, I have been <laughs> advised against that announcement. Um, may I, in acknowledging Mike, say that for the last six weeks he has been the government spokesperson on defence. Um, I want to say that I appreciate the pressure that that would bring to him. His senior minister has not been participating in this election. And I think that says a lot about what has happened in terms of the record of this government in defence. Mike is a person who clearly has a lot of passion for the portfolio and is a good minister. Um, what is required in defence is a strategic whole of government approach. Um, we have not had that for the last six years. In 2009, we were promised a plan that the opposition supported. There was bipartisanship in the road forward. This is a difficult, expensive, um, goalpost moving portfolio where today's technology is redundant very, very quickly. We had a plan in 2009 at 3% real growth, indexed to 2.5% with a strategic reform program returning $20 billion to the budget for capability. That was a plan supported by the department. That was a plan that appeared to have whole of government support. It lasted all of two weeks. That was a plan that we believe would have taken the politics out of defence resourcing. What we have seen since then has been the trashing of the defence budget and the trashing of defence resourcing, particularly on the capital side of the account. Now that leaves us in a position where there are a number of really pressing issues. The first, of course, has occurred. The overnight demise of our amphibious capability. When people are not interested in the capability, when they're not interested in the portfolio, you get a menorah canimbla type of event. Cyclone Yassi bearing down on North Queensland. A Deputy Police Commissioner saying Cairns needs assistance and the Minister coming to the conclusion overnight that he doesn't have a menorah and he doesn't have a canimla because of corrosion. As a sailor, I can tell you corrosion doesn't occur overnight. He then is told Tobruk is on 48-hour standby. Tobruk then spends nine months in maintenance. 
This is because the minister is disinterested. He then takes $5 billion, 10% of the budget, out in one budget with an announcement the Thursday before the Tuesday of budget night. He takes us back to a level of GDP spending that is 1938 levels, 1.6% 1 of GDP on defence. Last time we spent so little in defence was 1938. Now what are we going to do about all this? Well, the first thing I want to underline is I'm not going to stand here and make the sort of promises that you are seeing unfold this week. We have said that we will do a new white paper, but the difference between our white paper and the one that's apparently already been abandoned after six weeks is that it will be a funding document. You won't see a, par a chapter seven that says defence entitled Defence Funding and Budget that has a page and a half of spin and not a single dollar figure. Now our plan and proposal is modest. There are some ISR platforms for the maritime space. There is a DFRDB indexing issue that is quite expensive and dominates uh, what we plan to do. Uh, we'll release this policy for the public to see it on Monday of next week, so I'm told. That, that's pretty changeable, I can tell you. Um, the fact is, this is not a portfolio that we want to be seen to be using as a political tool. The issues at stake, the objectives, are far too important and far too serious. So currently when you get onto the Sydney Harbour, the best example of the complete derogation of responsibility by this government in defence is a Spanish uh, AOR ship, a Spanish replenishment ship tied up at Garden Island, the Cantabria, a beautiful vessel. The reason is because we do not have any replenishment ship that is seaworthy. We're paying them, the Spanish Armada, $10 million a year to come to the Western Pacific to bail out the Navy. I'm embarrassed about this scandal. And it is a scandal. When we've got surface asset, assets on the maritime frontier uh, in the northwest and they have to go back to Darwin to refuel, this is not the way to run a defence portfolio. Um, you will see what our plan is. It will be a consulted plan, it will be a costed plan, it will be a plan that has a huge amount of common sense in it because defence know what they need. We have to marry those needs up with the available budget. That is our real challenge. Now we've said after 10 years we'll be at 2%. That is a very substantial commitment. The beginning of the commitment in defence for us was to say no more cuts. No more cuts was the first step that Tony Abbott took in reinvesting in defence capability and in our national security space. So 2% in 10 years is where we've got to get to. We're going to show you how to do that in a way that will be quite close to what happened in 2009, but which will be a document that we will be committed to, a promise that we will keep. Now the reason Stephen is not here, Stephen Smith is not here, is because his record in defence is, may I say, indefensible. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on the Honourable Mike Kelly. Well, thank you, Catherine, and thank you, David, for sponsoring this event. And thank you, uh, David, for uh, being here today. Um, the reason why the Minister is not here today is because he's doing his job. He's in Brunei at the ASEAN Regional Forum with other Defence Ministers, building the architecture that has been a hallmark of this government in terms of the big picture, the strategic picture of shaping our security environment. Um, I should say thank you also for having me here specifically today because um, I wouldn't be here without this hotel. My grandfather and grandmother met here in 1926, and so uh, I thank this building for uh, my uh, nascent. Um, look, it's a great thing to have this debate, and it's critically important. Uh, but to set the scene, um, I will deal with uh, the defence issue in, in two respects. One is that broader strategic picture of framing our environment, our security environment. The second thing is in relation to our capacity specifically. Firstly, let's set the scene. So, David would like you to believe that uh, you flicked a switch in 2007 and suddenly all these maintenance problems appeared because of the Labor government. But let's go back through the, the years of the Howard government. Let's firstly say that through the years of the Howard government, not once, not one year, 
did their funding hit the 2% of GDP mark. The last time that occurred, in fact, was in June 1995 under the Hawke-Keating government. The last time the government came close to that mark was in 0910 under this government when it was 1.94%. So let's get the, the record straight there. In relation to that record of the Howard government, let's also drill down on some of these broader strategic issues. When they first came in, of course, we had the famous uh, diplomatic disaster of the deputy sheriff comments that uh, really disappointed many of our neighbours in the region and also was a contributing factor and a significant factor in us losing under the Howard government our bid for a UN Security Council seat in 1996. Major opportunity lost there. If we then move forward from that, we uh, look at what Ian McLaughlin did with the CSP program. So many babies thrown out with bathwaters during that period, which led us to the dire situation we faced in deploying to Interfet and Timor with the logistic challenges we were faced. And I know there's many of you in the room who will remember that. Obviously some, uh, some nice uh, images of the duck above the water, but furiously below the water, the organisation was deeply challenged by what the CSP program created. Of course, at that time, we had the famous diplomatic disaster mark II of John Moore going out there and saying we were going to have hot pursuit across the Indonesian land border and then ha him having to be locked away and kept away from microphones for, for the, ever thereafter. Uh, this caused a huge problem with our relationship with Indonesia and, of course, it was technically wrong anyway. Uh, if we move on from that, we look at the children overboard affair, which was deeply challenging to me in uniform, and I thank God for Angus Houston and Gary Bornholt for holding the line during that experience. And then moving forward to the uh, terrible Australian wheat board scandal, which uh, was uh, a situation where we had a government who presided over the greatest violation of the sanctions regime in relation to Iraq, uh, for which we went to war to uphold. $300 million going into the war chest of the enemy, we were sending our soldiers in to fight. And I spent a year in Iraq myself watching people look for those ghostly weapons of mass destruction that never appeared. And I'm well aware of the advice that was given to the government at that time in that respect. And that was the other great failure. There is no greater failure in public policy than to take your nation to war for no good reason. No greater failure. And that stands as the greatest public policy failure in this nation's history. Billions of dollars wasted, thousands of lives lost for no good reason, for a false premise. That is a huge condemnation of the previous government. Then, of course, we look through these procurement issues. We have massive problems uh, in our procurement issues because of the under-resourcing of sustainment by the Howard government, particularly in relation to the Collins. And when we talk about these amphibious vessels, and you look at the decisions that were made over the Manura and Canimbla, uh, rust buckets bought from the US tried to bring them up to some sort of standard. We got good use out of them by our Navy personnel who always do the best with what they're given but a very poor investment, a waste of money in effect. And now, of course, we have the LHDs coming on stream which will remediate our amphibious needs and we step forward and acquire the tools as well. In addition to that, of course, you had the disastrous Seeps right decision, $1.4 billion, just about the entire budget of the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry on a platform that not gave us not one minute of flying time. $40 million on landing craft, which didn't fit any vessel we had or any vessel we were going to acquire. The decisions that were made in relation to the MRH-90 and Tiger, which were very hasty, improper specifications, lack of understanding of the networking requirements and uh, interoperability issues, which we have now taken forward and remediated. So with all these deficiencies, we then come into government in 2007, inheriting a procurement and acquisition program where a previous government under-resourcing sustainment, uh, the hollowing of capability, acquiring for but not with, chasing capability tails, uh, making inappropriate decisions and not drilling down carefully enough. So we established the projects of concern regime. That mechanism took on board 21 projects that were off the rails under the previous government. We've now reduced those projects down to six. And I'm really pleased with the cooperation and uh, the participation of the proponents and the industries in that project and the, uh, that process, it's working very well. And now, of course, uh, the MRH-90s are coming on stream, the Tigers are coming on stream. And I must say that in this time, we are seeing the greatest capability 
deployment in this Defence Force in my quarter of a century of involvement in the Defence Force. With the two LHD, LHDs, the air warfare destroyers, 7,500 vehicles for the Army from heavy to medium trucks to protected mobility vehicles, the G-Wagons to the 22 attack helicopters, the, the 46 MRH-90 helicopters, the 24 Seahawk Romeo helicopters coming on stream to remediate that Sea Sprite disaster, the extra C-17s, the 7CH-47F uh, tactical lift aircraft for the Army, the uh, Chinooks. Uh, we're seeing, of course, the C-27J aircraft coming online, the decision made there in relation to those 10 aircraft. They've uh, really ridiculously uh, criticised by the opposition uh, when they should have looked in the detail at the ANAO report which said this was good value for money and it was good value because it, we got it at a discount, we got it because we uh, could ma make interoperability uh, gains out of that project and we could ensure the safety of our people uh, with the force protection capabilities on board that aircraft. So we've got an exciting future in front of us with bringing online these capabilities and the decision made today to uh, accelerate the program of bringing forward the AOR construction to meet the industry issues that were faced in that period from 2015 to 2018-19 that will be met with this program. They are capabilities required for us because they weren't planned for uh, by the previous opposition. Getting the Cantabria involved has enabled us to examine that platform and to also build relationships with Spain as well as addressing our short-term needs. Uh, I'll, I'll obviously be talking more during the course of this debate on what our intentions are in terms of the future of the Defence Force but I'm also particularly proud of the way we've adjusted our strategic approach to civil military planning and our capability in dealing with complex multidimensional emergencies and navigating our way out of the two wars that we inherited also from the opposition. Thank you. Now, we'll get off to some fairly fast and furious questionings at the moment from Aspie. Uh, but first of all, Peter, if I may, just uh, a quick question from the floor with a two-minute answer only. Mike Kelly, starting with you. Um, when did you hear about the Navy's plan to move to the north and northwest? When were you informed? And secondly, is this about policy or politics? Two minutes. Please. Sure. Well, uh, this has its birth in the Force Posture Review, which took some time, a couple of years, to formulate with uh, independent uh, people involved in that process. Uh, they consulted widely within Defence and, uh, and other areas across the nation, produced a broad range of recommendations, one of which was affecting fleet-based east and the future challenges of porting larger... Sure, the white paper basically said, well, uh, that will be expensive and would need to be looked at more carefully. So what we're doing at is looking at it more carefully. We're now appointing a, a future Navy task force made up of the Secretary and the CDF uh, with ex officio involvement from the Chief of Navy. Uh, this now brings it back to Defence to examine the challenges of bringing those vessels online and to drill down on that recommendation and come up when, with solutions. When did you hear about it? Well, this has been bubbling through with us from the Force Posture Review until now. Uh, so the Minister and I and, uh, and the Prime Minister have been involved in discussing these issues for some time since the uh, Force Posture Review. All right. David Johnson, thank you very much. Uh, on asylum seekers, the Navy has raised issues personally with you about this. How do you reconcile those and what sort of problems uh, do you envisage will be caused if uh, an incoming Abbott government actually asks the Navy to send back those folks? Boats is just one small part of dealing with our northern and northwestern maritime border. Um, we've set out a suite of issues to deal with asylum seekers coming by sea. Turning back the boats is something that apparently everybody agreed could have been done prior to 2007. Indeed, in terms the of the Navy concerned, in, ter in terms of the that? Prime Minister saying turn back the boats, certainly and we have turned a number of boats back. Now, these operational matters are for Border Protection Command. They will make an assessment as to what is feasible, when, how and why, in terms of solace and other things. Safety of life at sea. Excuse me, using acronyms. The Navy is fed up. We've burnt out virtually the whole of our Armadale class patrol boat fleet. 14 vessels purchased for $600 million. They've operated at three times their intensity, with 50,000 people coming on 750 boats in four years. Uh, they've had to operate in sea states of four and five because people were in the water. A thousand people have died. Um, this has been a maritime policy failure of historical proportions, generational proportions. 
Now, the Navy's fed up. It's a nine-day turnaround from Darwin to Christmas Island. Um, I want to support them. The way forward is for us to engage Indonesia. It's not about what we do on the water. It's about what happens in Jakarta with respect, care, and real hard attention and diplomacy, military to military, I think we can solve this reasonably quickly. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. We now move to our key and highly informed questions from ASPE, starting with uh, ASPE's Executive Director, Peter Jennings, and the answers will be four minutes with a bell at three minutes. Peter. Kath, thanks very much, and uh, Mike and David, thank you very much for uh, participating today. It's, it's very much appreciated. Uh, my question is on defence white papers. Uh, the coalition we know has promised a new white paper in 18 months. Uh, Labor has recently released a white paper, but it looks as though you'll need to adopt a new policy statement to address some recent changes in priority. So, how do you propose to go about developing a new policy statement, and how will it address the mismatch between resources and plans, which seems to be a feature of the current situation? Obviously, you, uh, the key test of a government is to be able to adapt and uh, adjust to changing circumstances. Uh, it's uh, like the old saying in the army, a good plan never survives contact with the enemy, um, but having a plan is good. So we have start points, uh, but also we uh, have had the issues that are associated with getting involved in high technology platforms as well, like the Joint Strike Fighter. And that is where a country like Australia has to be, uh, because we must dominate the qualitative edge over the quantitative edge. And that's where all the risks are. So there's been some reprofiling and delays in relation to the Joint Strike Fighter. Um, but also, uh, you know, in relation to investment in defence, uh, this GDP figure is a bit of a furphy. And, you know, making this statement about 2% of GDP within 10 years is, is completely uh, useless. Effectively, what we need is a commitment of what are you spending over the forward estimates. We're committing $114 billion over that period, uh, $26.2 billion in this large last budget, which is a $2 billion increase on the year before. These are concrete specific measures. We've produced a, a future submarine industry skills plan uh, to match our maritime ambitions and making the announcement today to put the final piece in that, that puzzle. Uh, we have a defence capability plan ready to go. The public version of that will be released uh, should we retain government within only a few weeks and the defence industry policy statement will accompany that and we'll set a very clear map of how these uh, projects will be profiled. In bringing forward the AORs, we're actually saving money in the budget because we're spending so much money trying to keep the uh, success and, and serious afloat that we'll actually save money by bringing those projects forward. So we have a very clear track forward. We're managing it within defence. We've kept cutting our sale to manage uh, fiscal circumstances, but the savings that we have made within defence have enabled us to, to invest and keep those projects on foot. Um, and what we've heard from the coalition is no difference. They haven't pointed out a single difference in savings or spending that they would make from us. We have pretty much a bipartisan approach to uh, budgetary issues, as far as I can tell, because there's been no specific detail from them on any of those issues. David Johnson. Well, we had a plan in 2009 which we believe was a bipartisan, feasible, doable plan. And as I said, it lasted all of about two weeks. We've got another plan now, this year brought forward, and that's lasted all of about six weeks. Because if you look at what is said in the Force Post Review and in the White Paper, you will see in black and white that the experts inside the department have said this is the pathway in which we should, should go. Um, I love seeing a virtue made of numbers. You know, there's an explanation for all of the things that have happened in defence in the last six years from this government. A white paper that had a plan that had bipartisan support, I would have thought is a really important thing because politics should not be in the defence space. To completely rip the rug out from a 2009 uh, document that was consulted widely across the nation, had a huge amount of expense put into it by the department, and then just to junk it and pretend along the way that we were sticking to the plan but would ramp up later to the point where it became completely unfeasible to go vertical in terms of annual funding. Now we've said 2% in 10 years for good reason. That's the NATO average. We think that is doable, it is difficult, but it's a commitment. The first commitment we've made is not to cut defence. In the recent announcement about two weeks ago, there's a billion coming out in the third year of the out years. I mean, you, you have to say 
exponentially. When you cut funding to this particular portfolio, it costs you generational time and money. Now, I want a plan that is doable. I want a plan that we stick to. I want a plan that is legitimate and a plan that the department can draw and have confidence the government is going to support. Because to this point in time, in six years, every idea and plan that's been put on the table has been abandoned faster than the budget could catch it. Now, David Johnson, I'm going to follow up the second part of that question there, which, to be fair, I don't think you've answered. Sure. Um, how do you address the mismatch between resources and plans that feature well, in the current situation? Well, for instance, submarines is a very good example. You have an operational concept document. We've got C-1000 running with no operational concept document, and that's the evidence in Senate estimates. So we don't really know what we want submarines for, but we're talking about 12 in Adelaide because there's some political mileage in it. Let's see the concept document. Let's then marry up what we need to abandon in terms of capability because it's too expensive and risky and come to a conclusion on so many fronts, what is the capability that we require to meet the threats that we can identify and what can we afford? And what do we have the capacity to build and maintain ourselves? These are all questions that this government has never ever addressed. It's all about the big splash. You know, 100 joint strike fighters, 12 submarines, uh, 8 frigates with no money. And the next question is from Ashby's Andrew Davies. Um, thank you, uh, gentlemen. And noting Dr Kelly's point about the forward estimates being the only real money, nonetheless, both parties are on record saying that they aspire to take the defence spending to 2% of GDP. But why are we talking about a percentage of GDP and what's the basis of that in terms of matching strategy and resources? Good question. Yeah, it's a very good question. And, and we shouldn't get fixated on this, uh, this figure because it, it depends on what capability you need and whether you can pay for it. That's the bottom line. And uh, GDP fluctuates. There'll be times when you're in great wealth, times when you're not. And also, uh, the exchange rate has a big effect here. So the, the high Australian dollar has had a big impact on our ability uh, to maintain our defence capability plans. It's, it's been of enormous benefit in that respect. So it is a bit of a ridiculous um, sh you know, smoke screen to get involved in this discussion of GDP. We need specific commitments from the coalition in relation to what they intend to do. The defence capability plan is rolling. Since 2009, we've approved 150 projects worth $20 billion. The coalition remind me of old uh, comical Ali in Iraq you know, he's up there saying that there are no US forces in Iraq and in the corner of the screen there are all these pictures of armoured vehicles rolling across the Iraqi landscape. Yeah, just get out there and see the rolling out of these G-wagons and uh, the artillery pieces from the 777 howitzers we're deploying uh, and the attack helicopters, the MRH-90s. It's all happening. We're taking delivery of uh, two JSFs next year. The uh, Seahawks are in train. Uh, we're sending people over there to get trained up now. It's, it is all happening. You cannot pretend that it is not happening. Senator Johnson. Well, you know, this, this whole concept of 2% is something that the commentators have said is the NATO average and is a benchmark that you can adopt for a country of our size. Now, we've adopted it. The Prime Minister has adopted it. Joel Fitzgibbon, a former minister, has adopted it. Now, of course you need to marry the 2% to what your capability requirements are. But when you've grossly underfunded and trashed the defence budget by ripping $30 billion That's out of it... That's just not true. And these are Aspie figures. That's not true. When you've turned the budget into an unsustainable mess which is transformed across to a crisis, you look to benchmark somewhere desperately where you can aim at to try and remediate the financing and resourcing of the portfolio. Now, they're not my words. Independent commentators who know much more about this than me have called it an unsustainable mess, an unsustainable mess True. lurching towards a crisis. And that's where we're at today, no matter how you dress it up. And the next Aspie question is from Hayley Channer. Thank you. Gentlemen, I'm going to change focus slightly and my question relates to the drawdown in Afghanistan. And uh, there are three points that I would ask you to speak to on this issue. Uh, firstly, how long do you think Australia can remain in Afghanistan after the drawdown of troops in 2014? What are our remaining strategic interests in Afghanistan? 
And what are your plans to deal with the mental health issues as they may arise from returned defence personnel? Can we start with that, George? Well, um, we're going to close Tarrant Cout very shortly, in my understanding. Um, I haven't been privy to as many briefings on the current evolution there as I might have been. However, obviously we are interoperable with the Americans. What they do and how they perform going forward in terms of the management of security for Afghanistan is very much going to influence what we do. I see we've got uh, a small mentoring team into Kabul in the uh, anticipated by a press release of about uh, three weeks ago. Now, I think it's very fluid in Afghanistan. We need to be ready with special forces particularly to respond to issues as they arrive. I'm told that the incident reports are declining quite substantially. Um, that's very good. We need to see what's going to happen with respect to the way the Americans go forward. Training back home, of course, we had a no-win, no-loss situation. So there was an enormous amount of our budget tied up in a no-win, no-loss funding regime for training to deploy. Now, when we take that away, there is a substantial issue for us inside defence in terms of maintaining interest and training and capability inside Army. Um, as this plays out, uh, I think we need to be resilient and quite flexible in the way we go forward in our capacity to have a ready response should things suddenly turn, turn bad. Um, our ISR platforms, our capacity to understand the way evolutions are occurring in Afghanistan, I believe are very good. And these decisions have been made with the advice of the CDF and our American allies. I think the pathway forward is plausible and common sense and uh, I think very doable. Uh, firstly, I congratulate the coalition on the bipartisan approach we've had in Afghanistan. It's been very important, important to our troops. Um, Afghanistan has been a big focus for me. I was, uh, as Pulse Secretary for Afghanistan Transition, drilled deeply down on the issues there, and largely my military career was spent in counterinsurgency and stabilisation operations in Somalia, Timor, Bosnia and Iraq. Uh, and it's one of the things I'm proudest of, in that we reoriented our strategy in Afghanistan. Up until 2007, it had been a whack-a-mole type strategy. Um, you can't kill your way to success in these environments. The general rule of thumb is that counterinsurgency is about 20% security, 80% social, economic, political. We reoriented that strategy. We created the Australian Civil Military Centre, which has done a great job in developing our capacity to strategise across civil military planning. And I've been deeply involved in that, and it's kicking great goals, that centre. It did a lot of good work on rule of law issues in Afghanistan, for example. So uh, we've, we reinforced the security aspects of, de of deploying the provincial reconstruction team, building support for governance, and particularly, most particularly, focusing on our own redundancy, that is, building the capacity of the Afghan National Security Forces to assume responsibility for their own security. We've made great progress in that respect. The 4th Brigade is conducting independent operations now. Our focus has switched to the key combat support, combat services support and command and control areas and we're maintaining our mentoring and training in that respect. Uh, the evolution of our relationship now will move into a more normal defence cooperation type program where we'll be committing uh, 75 personnel to support the Officer Academy training establishment in Kabul. Uh, we'll also be looking to influence their uh, ethical and, uh, and moral frameworks, I might add, as well in uh, hoping to maintain the support of the community that we've seen up until now for the Afghan National Army. Uh, we will also, of course, look at the issue of potential continuing special forces uh, arrangements. Uh, obviously, that would depend on comfort around status of forces and mission uh, determination, but it looks at this stage that we will certainly be looking mostly at a mentoring training aspect there, but um, we're uh, flexible in that respect. In addition, we're committing $100 million from 2015 onwards uh, to help support the ongoing uh, improvement and uh, maintenance of the uh, Af Afghan National Security Forces. But we're also, importantly, committing $260 million into the aspects of strengthening that social, economic, political dimension, building capacity of governance, rule of law, uh, and uh, the development aspect of Afghanistan. Can I ask you both to comment quickly on the mental health issues of returning service? Well, I was going to talk about those later, but post-traumatic stress disorder um, is a very important issue for me. I have travelled over 700 kilometres by road to visit a soldier who was very, very deeply and badly affected by this in New South Wales. I've participated in a number of forums, including Soldier On and a whole host of other matters that are dealing with this insidious and widespread syndrome. Now, it is, it is the elephant in the room. 
we are going to have to marshal our forces to focus upon it. We're going to have to deal with it like an unseen threat. A lot of our people, a very high percentage of our people coming home, suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. It needs to be put on the table and acknowledged. Uh, absolutely, this is a subject very close to my heart, having served alongside uh, these friends of mine and having witnessed and been through uh, quite a bit of what they've witnessed and been through. I've had that situation of having to wash the blood of friends off, off my uniform. And I understand the, the pressure they go through. And it's a focus of this government. We've invested $93 million in dealing with mental health issues, uh, Department of Veterans Affairs, but also committed another $25.2 million towards this issue. Uh, it is a scalable issue, so at one end you will have these clinical problems, but there are various elements along the way in terms of decompression and providing those opportunities for people to work through, talk through uh, the issues that they face. Um, so I think we should be creative in that respect. I've got a farmer in my patch uh, who was providing opportunities for veterans needing to decompress on his farm, doing farm work, uh, farm mechanics and animal husbandry and river restoration, very therapeutic. Um, so I think we need to be very creative about how we address this issue going forward, but it is a key focus to this government. Thank you. The next ASPE question is from Mark Thompson. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, gentlemen, do you think that Australia needs to make a choice between its alliance interests with the United States and its economic relationship with China? And moreover, what are your priorities for defence cooperation with the United States and how would you approach defence with China. Mike Kelly. I'm very proud of the approach this government's taken in building uh, our relationships, confidence building in the region, which is so important for as the first step in your security framework. Uh, and the progress that we've made in our 2 plus 2 dialogues with Indonesia, Japan, South Korea, India, very important relationships in the region, and China uh, obviously is central as well. Uh, and of course, you've seen the progress, the tremendous progress this government's made in the relationship with China. Uh, of course, the US relationship remains a central underpinning of our security relationship. And uh, just about every generation of my family have fought alongside uh, the Americans in the First World War, Second World War, and all the deployments that I've been on. Uh, it, we share fundamental common values that makes that important, but it is important that we manage the rebalancing of the US uh, positioning in the region uh, in terms of the, the impact of that on relationships and I think we're well placed to do that. One of the things that I've found in building relationships myself and working very closely with the regional forces and partners is um, the issue of disaster response. Uh, we've built quite a lot of exercise and engagement around that issue and it helps you to build confidence generally. So that is uh, progressing extremely well and the civil military centre that we've established is, is being very fundamental to that as well. So it's not a zero-sum game, the relationship between China uh, and Australia and Australia and the US uh, can be managed and uh, can be managed to benefit to uh, both this nation and in terms of managing the impacts of uh, the tensions and relationships of those nations within the region. David. Look, as a Western Australian Senator, I can tell you that uh, our state is being developed by American investment. Gorgon is 40 trillion cubic feet of gas, enough to keep uh, a million people in energy in electricity for 800 years. Wheatstone next door is 36 trillion cubic feet. Browse is three times bigger than Gorgon. We'll be providing 20% of China's total energy needs inside the next 10 years. The principal beneficiaries in terms of profit and development will be American companies, Shell, ExxonMobil, Chevron, Apache. So that all of us have skin in the China game. The China-US equation is not mutually exclusive. We have a special relationship with the United States. It is special. It's a value-based relationship. We have values that are virtually interchangeable. But we also have special friends in that part of the world, Japan and South Korea. We must not forget that. They are special friends. My state was developed on Japanese investment. Take or pay for Woodside got my state going. I don't forget that. Japanese commerce has driven my state from its inception in the, in the 60s. China is now sending so many people to Western Australia, um, we see them as part of the furniture. So I'm very fortunate to have a perspective that says the relationship is not mutually exclusive. I think there's a huge future for all of us, particularly American investment in our part of the world feeding China. Thanks very much. And the next ASPE question is from Tobias Fekin.
Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. Thank you for your comments so far. I wonder if I can drag you kicking and screaming into the cyber domain, uh, which some have said is the fifth domain of warfare currently. Um, and I want to know, as increasing numbers of nations are now developing offensive cyber capabilities, what does this mean for the Defence Department and how have you been thinking about this? Um, and what policies will you put in place to ensure that Defence is prepared as an organisation um, for cyber operations, but also um, how is it going to play its role as well in regional de-escalation and capacity building? Thank you. Thank you. We'll start with that, John. Uh, one of the areas I have had a briefing in is Defence Signals Directorate, and I can tell you that uh, there are as many opportunities present themselves as there are threats to us in that space. However, PLA 3 out of Shanghai is a problem. Our miners know it. Um, the parliamentary website knows it, because that's been done over and hacked. The fact is the rules of engagement in this space are really important. We have the capacity to do things, but the rules of engagement have to be settled. Now, I think a really important meeting took place down at San Diego in California between uh, Xi Jinping and uh, President Obama, talking on this matter. The current status of Chinese libertarian view on intellectual property and its capacity to be ripped off cannot continue. And that's the message we would seek to engage them on, because as time goes by, they themselves will acquire intellectual property that they will want to retain. Now, I think um, we're doing a very good job in this space. We can do better. It's expensive. But the five eyes, I think, are performing admirably and impart confidence that we have the capacity to put up the necessary defences needed to protect our special and classified information. A very important issue for the future, and it doesn't uh, just extend, of course, to the uh, immediate security aspects of this, but of course across industrial espionage and broader uh, attacks that, uh, that Australia may face uh, right across the spectrum. Uh, we've stepped forward very vigorously in this respect to establish within defence, of course, the Cyber Security Operations Centre, but um, recognising that more global spectrum of threat, we have established now a whole of government uh, uh, cyber security operations capability uh, here in the ACT. Uh, that will be a uh, coordination of the effort in that respect. And, of course, I must say, too, that the, the full rollout of the National Broadband Network will help in this respect. It's much easier to secure uh, a, a uh, fibre-optic network than the, the uh, proposal that's been put forward by the Coalition. But it is a, an area where we must be vigilant and aggressive and research must be uh, funded and supported, and we're doing that across the spectrum and establishing priority industry funding in certain aspects of that, like anti-tampering technologies and the like. And we're seeing some of those technologies uh, and companies uh, here, right here in the ACT with Northrop Grumman Australia working together with M5 uh, to uh, provide support in that respect. So it is an area where uh, we must continue to invest and, and in intelligence in this area is important too. And we've increased intelligence funding by 38% and 23% uh, and uh, increase there too across the forward estimates. Well, I'm just going to follow up this because a recent AFPI report that many of you will be familiar with mm. talked about uh, the poor performance effectively of government agencies mm. because of a lack of coordination and a lack of leadership at the top. Can you both just very briefly, for about one minute, address those very real concerns, I think? That's a product of cost. The cheapest producer of systems, hardware, chips and all of that is China. Um, we have been pursuing... Uh, IT, process, equipment, hardware on the basis of cost. That has been a problem. Thankfully, in the national security space, we don't do that. Well, that's uh, fundamentally why we've established the facility and the centre of activities as we have uh, under the Attorney General and ASIO uh, to make sure we have better coordination across the spectrum in Australia. Um, certainly within defence, we've been... Uh, going down this road for some time now and the uh, operations centre was established under John Faulkner and he was a key driver in addressing that issue from the defence perspective. So uh, these matters are being gripped up. Uh, you need to stay flexible and agile in this space uh, because the threats morph and change continuously. So uh, we will need to keep a close eye on this issue. It will be a fundamental aspect of uh, our security challenge in the future. I guess that's somewhere the government really can act and make a difference, yes. though, in terms of coordination. Absolutely. And do you, do you concede that there have been problems? Oh, look, I think uh, for years now, people have been caught a bit on the hop with uh, what's generally taking place in the 
digitisation of the battle space, um, and so we've been remediating that since 2007. We can talk more about oh, that. Thanks very much. The next ASPE question is from Ben Schreer. Thank you, Ka uh, Catherine, um, gentlemen. Three questions <coughs> on the future submarine. <coughs> the future submarine will cost around about $30 billion and more, plus operating costs and critical issues of crewing. How will this affect the rest of ADF capability? Second question, what plans will you put in place to address the acquisition of submarines in the next term of government? And third question, what do you see as the strategic purpose of submarines for Australia? Thank you. Okay, our plan looks something like this. We need to have a look at the SLEP program for columns, Submarine Life Extension Program. If that's feasible and viable and we get it costed down to the last dollar and we get a proper schedule to avoid a capability gap, we should pursue it. That is a big question mark. Because if we can succeed in uh, avoiding the redundancies of Collins and giving it some more life, we will take the pressure off C-1000. C-1000 is a huge challenge to us both indigenously having the technical capacity to go forward. It is a massive, massive program that we don't for one minute take for granted. We will need a lot of assistance. The reason we need submarines be is because for us they will be the most uh, premier defensive deterrent capacity that we could have. They, um, Collins living in the layer in hot water equatorial littoral waters that are reasonably shallow at four knots is virtually undetectable when it's reliably performing at its best. Now technology's moved on, um, we need to keep pace with that. The new vessels which are extraordinarily complex will require an enormous amount of time. We've virtually wasted, 2008 this went to NSC, we've virtually wasted the last four or five years. Not a lot has happened because there has been no real commitment by government to a plan out to the future. That's why we're talking about a new white paper that will deal with this particular issue as best we can in terms of the plan. But Collins has to be adjudicated upon first. Well, again, nothing specific, another white paper. So effectively what the government's been doing in this space has been the deep remediation of the sustainment and uh, life extension, deep cycle maintenance, uh, revisiting the whole regime under which that happens. We know we can get uh, quite a bit of extended life out of the platform. We've look, looked at the way the US has done this with the Ohio, but the plan for the future submarine is now coming online. We've developed the future submarine industry skills plan. Um, the way it will be managed is to determine the framework of a submarine. Two key components of that is determining propulsion systems and combat systems. So we're establishing a land-based propulsion testing facility which will resolve that propulsion aspect. And we're also now selecting the uh, ANBYG-1 combat system, which will be the two key determinants. The program that we will adopt in relation to the submarine, and just commenting briefly on the operational needs of that, there is a broad spectrum uh, of operational benefit from submarines. Uh, one of those, just to name one, is that they are the best ASW platform. So each unit of a submarine is, is magnified in its importance above other fleet units. Um, but our approach to the construction program will be to adopt a rolling build program with intervals between keels so that in particular from keel one to keel two we learn lessons uh, and then as each keel evolves over time we can include improvements in technology and innovation, uh, retrofit where necessary on earlier platforms and just push off platforms that can't be uh, retrofitted with those improvements. So what we look to do now is establish a rolling program of submarine build uh, for as far as, as we can see into the future to enable us to have both the industrial capacity and the operational capacity that uh, submarines can deliver for this nation. All right, thank you. And the next ASPE question is from Natalie Sandy. Thank you, Catherine. Citibank, McKinsey and others have projected Indonesia to be one of the world's top six economies by 2030. If Indonesia indeed becomes a much more powerful player relative to Australia, what will be the impact on our defence relationship? And what will you do to promote closer engagement? Thank you. I'll start with that. Well, for a long time now, our CDFs have had a very close and important relationship with their counterparts in Indonesia. I actually value the um, defence attaches as 
a force element group that's about two or three down the line. Indonesia is a classic focus for military diplomacy. We've achieved some miracles in the past on that front. I think things have fallen into a state of disrepair in recent times. Um, I'm looking with the CDF, if I'm fortunate enough to get the job, to put together a team of respected people who speak the language up there to go in and engage and take the relationship to another dimension. Bear in mind, when we terminated their supply of meat without notice, in, in, in the abrogation of the beef trade, we did enormous amounts of damage to this relationship. We need to set about the task of quietly, away from the glare of media scrutiny, rebuilding the relationship. Uh, it's been a great pleasure for me to have a good relationship with many TNI colleagues over the years. Uh, in particular, I, I met SBI when he was still a general, actually, and was impressed with his intent to transform the TNI within the Indonesian society and, and situation, and he's carried through with that, and a very admirable man. And our relationship with Indonesia has never been better, never been better during those uh, really dark days of the Howard government when um, the diplomatic relationship was very, very strained. Uh, it was actually the two-track diplomacy b between the militaries that, uh, that was actually working effectively to, uh, to maintain engagement, and uh, that continues. Uh, and certainly into the future, it is the most critical immediate relationship we have. Um, and obviously, the sorts of pronouncements we've had in relation to this asylum seeker issue really threatens that. It really does threaten that. And you've heard very clear statements coming out of Indonesia as to that being the case. Of course, this crazy announcement just recently of buying 700,000 Indonesian fishing boats and deploying police into uh, Indonesia without any consultation with them has certainly ruffled a lot of feathers. Um, I'm very confident uh, of our ability to steer that relationship uh, effectively. Uh, it is a priority for us and it's, uh, it's a key to our future. Well, before we finish, I think uh, many people here would like to hear your thoughts on the Syrian situation, both of you. Mm -hmm. US Security Council will assess it. Australia takes over the role as president uh, for its one-month term on Sunday. Dave Johnston, for you, what are the key concerns as the international community examine what's going on there? Well, I think the first concern from a d defence perspective is that we get the facts right. I want to know exactly what the UN um, inspectorate find, what, what assumptions they make, what principles and evidence they use to make determinations, if they make determinations at all. Um, I think the whole thing is very, very hazy at the moment, which means it's potentially very dangerous to speculate in any shape or form as to who did what, what the level of what they did um, was, um, and all of those matters feeding into some sort of military response. I'm very cautious about getting in to that space at this time when we don't really have a handle on the facts. You're, you're worried about the assertions that it does appear that it will, our Prime Minister has said it, the US President has said that they're blaming the Assad regime. I want to see the basis upon which these matters are put forward. Not that it really concerns us greatly, but the point is if, if there's going to be some sort of action um, a, a action that we acquiesce in, uh, and we're talking, you know, Tomahawk land attack missiles, uh, I think that is really serious stuff that we want to have a really solid foundation of fact before we sort of acquiesce on that front. It's probably a bit unfair to ask David in this situation, um, but uh, certainly I appreciate the comments that the Coalition have made have been very prudent, um, and the briefings that I've had uh, and also, uh, the, the Middle East has been an area of deep uh, interest and concern and responsibility for me for many years. Um, I had the Middle East desk in strategy group and obviously spent a lot of time on the ground. Uh, and the situation that is evolving there is incredibly complex. And uh, when you have bad faith external actors also uh, involved in this with Iran and Hezbollah, it is deeply, deeply uh, uh, antagonistic to a perfect solution. There are at least worse options that you uh, are faced with. Uh, certainly, it is appearing now that the evidence is growing in relation to uh, a chemical attack having, been having taken place on the 21st and that the uh, Syrian authorities were involved. We need to see the results of the investigation uh, that is occurring on the ground at the present time. Um, but certainly, we must, we must take this very seriously. Uh, this is a, a humanitarian crisis that, uh, that needs to be dealt with robustly. Um, 
but we also must be, I think, cautious in, to some degree, uh, given our previous experiences in Iraq. But the evidence is emerging quite strongly now, and, uh, and I believe that uh, th we also need to start leveraging greater pressure on resolution of the situation of a, as a whole. There have been 100,000 deaths and a, over a million refugees in the conflict, and so we need to bring it to an end in general, leaving aside this terrible situation that's emerged over these uh, use of chemical weapons. Gentlemen, thank you very much. That is the ASPE Great Debate for this year. And I'd now just call on Peter Jennings for concluding remarks. Well, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this, this may not be the debate that we uh, needed to have, but I think we're very, very glad indeed that we actually had such a substantive uh, and feisty and interesting and useful debate today. And I'm, I'm really grateful to uh, Mike and to David for um, uh, uh, giving us that, uh, that sense of uh, substance which um, uh, arguably could be said hasn't been too present in some of the um, other debates which we've seen on uh, TV over the last, over the last few weeks. Um, I'm really delighted at the willingness both of uh, Mike and of David to come to terms uh, with some of the enormously challenging issues which are facing defence. Well, um, happily it's not my role to declare a winner. Um, there are no worms, um, there are no online voting trends uh, scrolling under the screen to distract us. I'd like to think that defence has won on this occasion. <laughs> Um, and uh, gentlemen, can I say uh, to you both, I'd like to wish you and your families well uh, in the demanding days of what's left of the campaign. Um, having been through a couple myself, I know how arduous they are, how sleep deprived you get, particularly towards that last week. But it's important that you uh, come through this ready for whatever challenges face you after September 7. Um, and as Stephen Loosley has, uh, has said, um, Aspie will seek to make this um, a regular event in the electoral calendar. Um, one thing I can say is that uh, win, lose or hung parliament, um, Aspie will be there uh, post the election campaign offering our views, uh, challenging views at times. Um, you won't always love what we have to say, uh, but I hope you love the underlying principle about why it is that we do say these things. Um, and in that spirit, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who don't actually have copies at the moment, we have out, uh, as you leave uh, in the foyer, uh, copies of our Agenda for Reform document, which was uh, published uh, to critical acclaim about uh, 10 <laughs> days or so ago, which sets out our, uh, our blueprint uh, for what we think any uh, incumbent government should think about and tackle. Uh, past the election. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank uh, Hewlett Packard for uh, their support mm -hmm. uh, in uh, putting on this event. I'd like to thank uh, Catherine McGrath for her adroit chairing. Thank you, uh, Catherine. Um, I'd like to thank you all very much for uh, attending. I, I know how hard it is to get people to leave their uh, offices during the middle of the day. Uh, and in closing, can you please join me in thanking Mike Kelly and David Johnson for their lively debate. Thank you.